Shall we start? So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa Oliveira. I lead the Organizational Behavior Lab, and I also lead the um, MSc program on Organizational Psychiatry and Psychology here at, uh, at King's. Um, just very happy uh, to have you all here. Uh, one of the aims of the event was that we could have an event that would encourage the participation of students, pra practitioners, and academics from very different areas. So I'm very happy with um, uh, your, your, your presence here today. Let's start with some housekeeping information. We are not expecting any fire alarm exercise or anything like that, so if it rings, it's serious. And we should go out, and the next exit is at the reception level. Our meeting point is on the other side of the street, so it's quite straightforward. Anyone looking for toilets, they, you'll, you'll have uh, toilets here at the mezzanine level, and then near the educational hub where we will have the drinks reception after the event. Um, one of the reasons why um, we decided to start the lab was that we wanted to have a group that would encourage research in organizational behavior. Um, and by, by me, by we, we, I mean myself, Ricardo Tomasi, and Mayana Duncan, so we are the um, organizational psychologists here at King's, so we wanted uh, to have um, a space where we could um, not only promote and develop our research interests, engage students, um, engage different collaborations um, either from the industry, other faculties at King's um, and outside of King's. So I'm very happy that we have started uh, with this uh, uh, group. Um, and I'm very happy to have this inaugural lecture, uh, lecture today with uh, Kerry Cooper. Um, the first event that we wanted to have um, would have the topic of health um, and well-being at work. This is one of our shared interests. So this was one of uh, our key um, uh, characteristics uh, or that we define as a key characteristic for the event. But we also wanted to have the opportunity to have a discussion on the different topics and concerns associated with health and well-being at work. So we invited for our panel today um, three colleagues that have uh, worked with us and that represent either practitioners' perspectives, academics' perspectives, um, or different uh, disciplinary perspectives. Um, the structure for the event today um, it's quite straightforward. We will start with a lecture by Kerry. Um, we will then move into a discussion with a panel and have the contribution of each member of the panel and then just open the floor to any discussion, uh, to the discussion with the audience and any questions or comments that you would like to make about today's presentation or just the topic in general. Um, I would like to welcome Kerry to um, start with his uh, presentation and just do a brief introduction. For those of you that uh, are not familiar with, work, with the work of Kerry, which I, I suppose very few. <laughs> so Professor Sir Kerry Cooper is the 50th anniversary professor of organizational psychology and health at Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. Uh, Kerry is the president of the Shotwood Institute of Personnel and Development, CIPD for short. He's the immediate past president of the British Ac Academy of Management, the president of the Institute of Welfare, and the chair of the National Forum for Health and Wellbeing at Work. In 2014, uh, Kerry was knighted by the Queen for his contribution to social sciences. Um, in terms of academic work, and for those of you that are academic, academics, um, Kerry has an H index of 87. And if you look into his profile on ResearchGate, you will find that he has over um, 70 books, over nearly 400 uh, chapters, um, over 770 papers, and many other research outputs. 
Kerry is the editor-in-chief of the Wiley Blackwell Encyc Encyclopedia of Management, the editor of Who's Who in Management, the editor of the Wiley Blackwell Wellbeing, and the founding editor of the Journal of Organizational Behavior. So for my students that this year have to write up their dissertation in a, a paper ready for submission, and uh, one of the journals is the Journal of Organizational Behavior. He started it, yeah? so don't look <laughs> at me. Kerry uh, is also the founding and former chair of the gov government think tank, the Sunning Dial Institute, and the lead scientist on the government office for science foresight project on mental capital and well-being. Uh, Kerry was also the chair of the Global Agenda Council on Chronic Disease and Mental Health of the World Economic Forum. He was voted as, uh, by HR Magazine as the most influential, influential HR thinker for several years and put into the uh, HR Hall of Fame in 2017. Kerry was made Honorary Fellow of the British Psychological Society of the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Physicians of Iron, Ireland in Occupational Medicine, and many more. Kerry holds honorary doctorates from a number of universities, including Sheffield, Bath, Aston, Harriet Watt, Middlesex, Wolverhampton, and others. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Sir Professor Sir Kerry Cooper. I just came out of okay. Thank you very much. There are always these long ones like that, right? Thank you, Teresa. Abrigado, Teresa. She's Portuguese. That means thank you. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you're not going to have any trouble with my Mancunian accent, are you? None at all, huh? I had my Manchester City scarf with me, but I left it back in my flat. I have a flat here in Grove Lane or Camberwell Grove. So I'm not right around the corner from you guys. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to do today, because we know you're not stressed out, right? Your lives are easy, nine to five, right? Two hours off for lunch, lots of massages at your desk, uh, mindfulness training at lunch, right? Sushi at your desk as well. No, what I'm going to talk about is health and well-being and why it's a top issue now. Uh, can you hear me up there? Because this fell off. That's all right? All right, we're OK then. So what I'm going to do is tell you why this has become kind of a big area. Um, so let's take a look at this. All right. The first time ever in the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, it's the HR professional body of which I'm president, right? We have 157,000 people, uh, HR professionals, because we're the accrediting body for the UK, Ireland, and a couple other countries. And we, every year, we look at absence, sickness absence, and a whole load of figures like that. In the first time it changed, where musculoskeletal, i.e. backache and those kinds of things, was the leading cause of sickness absence. In 2015, take a look at stress. Uh, for some reason, they, they have two separate categories. One called stress and one called mental ill health. Ag aggregate those up, they're the leading cause of sickness absence. Right? And so that was the first time it changed. Look at this year. If you take a look at the right, you can't, it's in great detail. Just look at the one on the right, the round circle. Of long-term sickness absence, 57%, this is the health and safety executive, 57% of all sickness absence is now due to stress at work or depression, anxiety, and stress, what we call the common mental disorders. And only 25% are musculoskeletal. I think part of that as well, by the way, is that musculoskeletal was higher because people didn't want to admit that they were stressed at work. So they would go in, they say, I have a backache, anything to get out of work. And so there was a little bit of a cover-up on that, uh, hiding it. But nevertheless, it, is, it really is the big issue. Uh, and if you take a look at this, uh, just in 2017, 18, 600,000 new cases. It's, just, it's, it's a real nightmare. You operating in the Institute of Psychiatry, really, you got a job for life here. If the government ever damn invests in mental health, uh, if we ever get out of this goddamn Brexit. But that's another issue. We'll get into that later, the stress of Brexit. I'm doing a book on that right now, an edited book with psychologists across the country. Um, anyway, um, now here's something interesting. So we have sickness absence rates. We have a load of negative indicators uh, that, that uh, the common mental disorders are a real leading problem. 
But before the recession started in the year 2007, a group of economists, top ex economists for the Sainsbury Center of Mental Health, it's now called, Sainsbury no longer funds it, so it's, it's self-funding, so it's now called the Center for Mental Health, found even before the recession that presenteeism, how many of you know what presenteeism is? Raise your hand. Oh, that's good. So you're getting, they're teaching them the right stuff. This is it. I like to hear that. So, but you probably think presenteeism, incidentally, is just coming to work ill, just to show, uh, you know, be present, show FaceTime. It's a bit more than that. But anyway, but in 2007 was the first time, even before the recession, that presenteeism was double the cost of absenteeism. Now, let's take a look at what it really is. I think this is really important because I, we're suffering from more from that now, in my view, than sickness absence. I was called up last week. I was called by radio, um, the Today program. In fact, it wasn't last week. It was this week, earlier this week. You know, the ONS had this survey that came out that said over the last 10 years that the sickness absence rates were dropping, and they called me up to say, isn't that great? That means the workplace is really on top of, you know, they're doing the right things in the workplace. I said, no, they're not. And they, and they said, what do, you, what do you mean? This was Nick Robinson. And he says, uh, and I was, I was in, no, it was last week, because was, I was in bed with the flu when, he called, when I had to do this interview. And what we have discovered is during the recession, in particular, uh, 2008, the presenteeism raise uh, uh, re increased dramatically, basically, because people, because 30 or 40% of people in the public and private sector lost their jobs. So you're working, and you're feeling ill, are you going to go, are you going to take off? No, you're going to turn in. You're going to show FaceTime because job insecurity is driving it, right? So presenteeism rose even faster than the 2007 figures and tripled during the recession period, right? So then, just as we're coming out, the UK knows how to do this. Uh, it decides it's going to have more insecurity, something called Brexit. So with Brexit, we have a rise yet again. So when he called me up and said, oh, it's a good news. The work environment's wonderful, isn't it, Kerry? Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the sickness absence rates are going. So yeah, sickness absence rates are going down but the, because people are scared, particularly in the finance sector and manufacturing and in food production. They're all scared they're going to lose their jobs. What's going to happen when Brexit hits, right? So the... It, Presenteeism is rising, but sickness absence is declining. Again, you want to show FaceTime. Just about turning up into the work environment. Oopsie doodle. Let me go back to this for a minute. Okay, so I hope you didn't see that slide. I'm going to ask you a question. You ready? <laughs> what proportion, now, what we want is this thing. We want the box on the left, don't we? The UK wants to no longer be seventh in the G7 on productivity per capita. We don't want to be 17th in the G20. We want to be a robust economy, and we want to have people well, and we want to have a good day at work, and we want to be motivated, right? So what proportion of people, I did a study of 39,000 people in the UK, we were looking at presenteeism and stress and a whole range of other things. What proportion of people do you think fall in the healthy and present category? Rate, percentage, just give me a percentage you think. Out of the 39,000, don't have to tell me 30, don't have to multiply it, just say 20%, 30%. What do you think? 45. Did you say five? 45. 45, oh, right in the middle there, okay. Are you a Lib Dem? <laughs> you should be, you should be. Anyway, I'm not going to get into the politics. Yes, I will later, by the way. Uh, okay, throw another number out. High, low? 28. 28.52. I mean, is that it? <laughs> it's typical academic. Okay, 28%. Nobody going any higher, huh? Okay, well, look at this. So only one in three of you are paying my retirement. Only one in three people, roughly, are productive and active in the workplace. 28% are consistently turning up when they're ill. That's the sickness presenteeism category. 13% are feeling okay and have absences, those are job, totally job dissatisfied people. You know, leaves on the line, please God, on the railway line. Let's have a strike, make Southern Air Railways go on strike again. Anything to have an excuse not to get into work. 24% have some absences, and that's partly stress related. 
uh, again. So it is a kind of a worrying phenomenon, this presenteeism, but it's now a lot of companies are measuring it. I mean, uh, Judith Grant from Mace is a big construction company, and um, she, they measure absenteeism, presenteeism, all this kind of stuff now, and a lot of companies are beginning to do it because it's a hidden thing. Before, if your sickness abscess went up, you knew you had a problem. Now it's dropping because people are scared to death of going off ill. We don't. We have to be have to get other indicators of the of the well-being of people at work. This is for anybody who wants this data. Here's the worrying bit of this. These are all the business cases from the Office of National Statistics, and and so on. Sainsbury Center again, but the worrying one is what the OEC did. OEC did, which is to look at every OECD country to say. What is mental health costing that country? And you know what our GDP is at the moment? It's like 1.2%. That's our growth rate. They said about the UK, and this was about 18 months ago, that we're actually, if we got rid of the mental health problems, the impact of the mental health problems on our productivity amounts to 4.5% of GDP. That's massive. That is really massive. That if we had that plus the 1.2%, then we're starting to compete with China and India but we don't have it, and we do have an issue here. Okay, if you want these slides, by the way, I'm sure they'll be made available. Is that all right? Yeah. Because they're all students and staff and all that funny thing. Okay, so what causes people to get ill? Do we have enough research? And the answer is, I shouldn't say this in front of an academic offense, we have more than enough research on what causes people to get ill. We don't need any more research on the stressors that cause people to get ill in the workplace. I think we know them all. There's one or two new ones, which I'll talk about in a minute, that aren't on this slide. There's one in particular. But basically, it's these factors on the left-hand side. Factors intrinsic to your job or your sector, the role you play at work, your relationships at work, your career development or lack thereof, the culture of it, uh, and for finally, the homework interface, how work interferes with home and how home interferes with work. And that affects you, the individual, which ultimately affects your symptoms, individual symptoms or organizational symptoms. For those of you working in organization behavior or organization psychiatry or organization psychology, or whatever euphemism you want to use, right, we tend to get the, the bottom box hit us. So I'll get called up and say, so I did a study on 97 rigs in the North Sea because people were falling off rigs and cranes were falling over, and it said it was human error, and we we're trying to find out what caused the human error. So then we did a three-year study. You know, it was kind of a depressing study in a way, because what we were doing is giving all the psychometrics to all these people on the rigs, and then getting a phone call saying, hey, I've got some good news for you. Two people have fallen off the rigs, so your sample has, you know, you have now a sample of two, and the next month it's three and five, and you're collecting all the data. Pretty depressing, really. But anyway, you get the message. We were trying to see if we could predict when we, have ac when we had accidents on rigs and things like that. So this was many years ago when we did that kind of study. But it's basically that box is the one that we look at. Absenteeism, uh, presenteeism, high labor turnover, accidents, poor quality control. And then if you don't deal with the problems on the left, you get the problems on the right, those coronary heart disease. These are all risk factors to a range of physical illnesses, not just mental illnesses, uh, and prolonged, and the, then the organizational equivalent of that is strikes, prolonged, uh, you know, frequent and severe accidents, apathy, that kind of thing. And just the model says, if you don't deal with the problems on the left, then you have a box six foot long that goes six foot down, and that's the end of the stress process. So we really, our job, I think, all your jobs, sorry about that, let me go back on. Oh, no, I'm going the other way. Our job really is to identify in workplaces what is it that causes people to get ill, right? That's our job. I mean, for people like you, students and academics, and people working in HR, our job really is to find out what is wrong, what is causing the problems there, and how can we correct it. That's one aspect of our work. And I think the other aspect of our work, how do you create an environment that, that people have a good day at work? No, they enjoy it. They actually want to come to work, are motivated. So that's the well-being dimension of it. So let's look at some of these factors. Factors intrinsic to the job. Too much work, too little work, which is what you have as students. Too little work, they don't push you hard enough. Is that right? Right? Okay, no. 
okay, too much work, too little work, time pressures. Uh, every job is different, and we've studied at Manchester and elsewhere where I've worked, probably 80, 90 occupations, so we've looked at quite a lot. I'll show you some of the results of some of them. But you'd be surprised that in job insecure times like we're really in at the moment, um, with growth rates, what was it, 0.2 of a percent last week growth, uh, and we almost were in recession. You have times like that when people who don't have enough to do worry. So it's not just overload, it can be underload. There's a wonder, aside from my books, there's another wonderful book. Uh, my book's outside, by the way, several of them. So if you want to get copies, no, I'm just joking. Um, my, uh, one of the books is really a wonderful book written by, do you ever read Catch-20? How many of you read Catch-22? Not many, you should read it. Your younger students should read it, it's great. Joseph Heller wrote this book about, uh, well, Catch-22 is just a fantastic book, but he wrote an original book, it was called Something's Happened, and it was about a guy having a stress breakdown in a company. And um, Joseph Heller had actually worked in an insurance company before he wrote Catch-22, which is an enormous bestseller, probably one of the best uh, selling books ever in, f in fiction. But he wrote about what he experienced when he was working in this insurance company. So some of this stuff is very akin to uh, the kind of thing you would find in the workplace and we, we find when we do our work. So for example, one of his characters says, this is what we call underload stress. I don't have enough to do. One of his characters says, I am bored with my work very often now. Everything routine that comes in, I pass along to somebody else. This makes my boredom worse. It's a real problem to decide whether it's more boring to do something boring than to pass along everything boring to somebody else and have nothing to do at all. So he's pretty, he's, he's, he's a clever writer. He's funny, but he, it's pretty powerful. Uh, one of the first studies I ever did when I was at Manchester, I did at Manchester Airport, all right? And you know, we wanted to take a look at air traffic controllers and I took, a, took my PhD student with me and we walked in and I don't know if you've ever been in an air traffic, you probably haven't. It's, pretty dark room, everybody's on screens, and little blips are going, and it's BA-742 heavy, which means it's a jumbo. So the word heavy is quite interesting that they put that there. I wouldn't have done that if, if I was doing ergonomics, because then people worry that's a big plane with a lot of people on it. I never understood why they did that. Anyway, so we go into the same, take my PhD student, and, and the person there says, okay, the person you're gonna interview, because I said to my PhD, I'm gonna show you how you do the interview so you can start doing the interviews. And we were taking blood chemistry of every one of the air traffic controllers, psychometric tools, everything. And he, so we walk over to the guy, and we're standing in back of him. He had five more minutes on his shift, and he turns around and he has two cigarettes in his mouth. I said, do you know what we're gonna get now, don't you? And it was a very interesting study. Um, but this is the kind of factors we found predicted it. Some of which we could change, like variable and high workloads, because they kept shifting, doing different shifts, and that caused problems because they weren't on a regular shift. Responsibility for lives, you can't do anything, because they are responsible for lives, and they knew it. Although we did mention the stuff about why are you doing heavy? Because that makes them aware of the number of people on an aircraft. Etc. But no, it wasn't the main part of it. But anyway, these were and training others while they're trying to do their job, uh, and, and so on. But these were the factors that predicted. Uh, we we were taking blood chemistry and looking at fibrinogen, which is a great indicator of uh, blocked arteries. So we're just trying to see which factors were predicting of it. Anyway, but that just gives you a kind of rough idea of that one. Uh, role you play in your organization. How much control and autonomy do you have over your job? Very important. Uh, and there's tons and tons of studies on this. The more you ha are in control, the better. If you think about even the contemporary issue that I keep alluding to, i.e. Brexit, you think about it, it really is a symptom of the problem that an individual would face, a, men a mental health issue. What are the two main things? Mainly the lack of control and uncertainty, right? So we have in Brexit, uncertainty, and then none of us feel we can control it. And that's what human beings experience. So that's why probably the mental health that we've had, the mental ill health of the country, when it's looked at retrospectively, we'll see a blip over this Brexit period, I think over the last three years. So having control is important, particularly in uncertain circumstances. 
So I like this from Heller too. This is a, a nice one from a middle manager in, a com in his company he wrote on something happened. He says, who doesn't have any, any influence, says, what would happen if deliberately, calmly, with malice aforethought and obvious premeditation, I disobeyed? I know what happened, nothing. Nothing would happen and the knowledge depresses me. I suppose it's about impossible for someone like me working in this company to can produce uh, any lasting effect. I have lost the power to upset things that I had as a child. I can no longer change my environment or even disturb it seriously. They would simply fire and forget me as soon as I tried. So it's an indication, I think, of the control issue. And it is still a, a really very, very important aspect. Oh, so let's look at this when we're talking about role. Um, it was one winter evening. Uh, I'm sitting in Manchester many years ago. And I get a phone call from California, where I originally come from. And it was from the professor of dentistry at the University of Southern California. And he said, the California Dental Association, I don't know if you know, Kerry, the dent dentists have a very high, um, for, as an occupational group, they have, the high, they have the highest proportion who never reach retirement age. They have high stress levels and everything else. I said, that's interesting. I mean, just looking in people's mouths all day long. Is it standing? What is it that causes it? So they said, would you like to come over and do a study? And I, it's Manchester, and it's November, and it's pissing down. And I said, well, I just don't know if I can do it. I'll be on, how's Monday sound? Can I get there by Monday? So I went over for a semester and worked with the University of Southern California Dental School. And we looked at California dentists. And in doing it, we published some papers on it. These are the factors that we found predicted ill health, anxiety among dentists. And what they were, it's all people problems. So it's not sitting looking in people's mouth. It is dealing with difficult patients, administrative duties, trying to manage a practice, the fact that my job interferes with my family life, but very important, the biggest predictor was patients perceiving, uh, the, the dentist, uh, patients perceiving them as an inflictor of pain. Isn't that odd? But it's all relationship things. So what they then did is changed the kind of curriculum, they didn't change the curriculum, they added to the curriculum the business about social skill development. So don't they have to be aware when patients, how do you relax people when you're a dentist rather than sit down, open your mouth, and let's go at it, right? It's quite interesting. By the way, we repeated this study with the, um, the British Dental Association, found very similar things here as well. There were different things as well because it's NHS or was NHS at the time. Relationships at work. Most important relationship you'll have is with your boss, whoever that is. That's what the evidence shows. Line managers, your boss is probably the main source either of your feeling thriving or stressing you. So what we should do, I guess all office places should have, you know how you have on a packet of cigarettes, you know, don't smoke, we should have a sign right here in this building outside, your boss is potentially dangerous to your health as you walk in. <laughs> so bosses, colleagues, subordinates, all these, but the most fundamental one is the boss and the government now, or at least Department of Health and Department of Work and Pensions, is looking at the line manager. Who, from shop floor to top floor. And you know what the problem we have in the UK? But we have a problem not just in the UK, it's most workplaces, is that people get promoted on the basis of their, comp, uh, their technical competence, not their people skills. So they get promoted into a management job, right? And of course they get one or two days training to do that. Wonderful. So you're a good teacher, great classroom teacher. I have to make more money. I can't do it as a classroom teacher. How am I going to do it? I have to become a head. I'm a great engineer. I love engineering. But I'll have to become an engineering manager to make money. The pyramid. And that really is dangerous. And we, we do it on the basis of their technical competence, whatever it is, not their people skills. So what companies really need to do now is do an audit of all their managers from the bottom all the way up to the top and then categorize them. Because some of them, HR will know, are really good people managers, just naturally. Not because they're trained. They had the technical skills, but they also just happen to have good people skills. Then there's a whole group, probably the biggest group, are totally incompetent when it comes to people and need training. Then there's a third group who you don't want to ever put near people, ever. You lock them in a room somewhere with a computer or a technical thing and just get rid of them. Now, and I'm serious, there will be some people who are untrainable. But the vast majority are trainable, 
and there's a natural, there's a small group of people. I, th I think it's probably 20, 60, probably 20, 70, 10, 15. The 10, 15 are really technically great. Good at IT, good at engineering. Please don't put them near people. All the training in the world won't, sh won't shift them. So we, we have to do that, and the UK certainly has to when you're seventh in the G7. Actually, we're not. We're now sixth, because we're now tied with Italy at the bottom. So Italy, you know, we've, we've moved up to tie with Italy. But Italy is a far way away from everybody else, as we are. Um, so relationships at work are important. Opening, this is my last time with Heller, but I love this one. This is the first paragraph of his book, Something's Happened. He worked in an insurance company, remember I said, for a number of years before he wrote this book. It's a fun book to read, by the way, but it's also quite powerful. He says, the opening paragraph, and he talks about relationships, how important they are. He says, in the office in which I work, there are five people of who I am afraid. Each of these five people is, a four, is afraid of four people, excluding overlaps, for a total of 20. And each of these 20 people is afraid of six people, making a total of 120 people who are feared by at least one person. I love this bit. In my department, there are six people afraid of me. And one small secretary is afraid of all of us. I have one other person working for me who's not afraid of anyone. Not even me, and I'd fire him quickly, but I'm afraid of him. <laughs> the thought occurs to me often there must be male clerks, assistants, uh, of all kinds, as you're afraid of everyone in the company. And there's one typist in our department who's going crazy slowly, has all of us afraid of her. Her name is Martha. Our biggest fear is she'll go crazy on a weekday between 9 to 5. We hope she'll go crazy on a weekend when we aren't with her. Now, it's humorous, but it's about relationships. And if you think about it, why do we come into work? Given the technology we have, we have Skype, we have all sorts of things. Say you're a student. Why do you have to be here? I mean, I can give you a lecture down on a Skype system, on a platform, right? Most office workers in insurance, almost all jobs other than like being a nurse or working on a paste assembly line, in case a paste assembly line is going AI anyway, and there's almost no people on it anymore, right? And nurses probably have to go in. And by the way, this is the thing that Corbin just said. He said, well, we can't give nurses four days a week. Did you hear that? This, he mentioned that. He said, we can't do that. I mean, I mean, no, so Corbin says, we're going to do it. We're going to have a four-day week. We're going to do it. But somebody else in, his, in the, in the uh, Labor Party, this, I think it was John McDonald, I can't remember, said, no, we can't do that. We can't do that because it will cost a hell of a lot of money. But actually, we could actually just have them a four-day week because other people, I think, are going to actually go down. I think we're going to have, we're going to get rid of probably the five working day week. And in, it, quite interesting, in Gothenburg in Sweden, they took all the civil servants working for the, the government of, of, uh, uh, of Gothenburg, all the local authority workers, lots of them. Half of them they put on a 30-hour week and half they kept on a 40-hour week. They paid them exactly the same amount of money who was more productive, had less sickness absent days, and less ill health. Can you imagine? The 30-hour week. The studies are showing that actually we waste a lot of time in the work environment, and we don't actually need to work that long, that long anymore. So the issue for your generation, I think, is going to be quite, you know, are we going to be working? And I remember when I first came, I'm that old, there was a, a prime minister you probably haven't even heard of. It's not Gladstone, by the way. I'm not that old. It was Harold Wilson who did a, a speech in, in the 1960s and said, by the year 2000, we'll be working 15-hour weeks. He called it the white heat of technology speech. Technology is going to do it. You know, we're working significantly more hours than we did in, 19, in the 1960s. In fact, right now, the average working week is 52 hours a week. And you know why it's 52 hours a week? Well, it's 52 hours a week if you where you're actually in a work environment. That's not adding on, oh, let, let's find out, because this is another source of stress in a minute. I'm going to ask you a question about that. So it's 52 hours because, and that doesn't include commute time, right? But let's try something else. And this is another source of stress, incidentally. The other source of stress is what we call techno stress. It's called emails. Now, let's find out from you guys. How many of you check your work, whether you're a student or a lecturer, or whatever you do for work, how many of you check your emails at night? Raise your hands. OK. OK, great. Just keep it up, by the way, because my books on stress are selling like hotcakes. So just keep doing that. <laughs> How many of you do it at the weekend? This is really great news. 
you're raising your hands there too. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be a role model, you two. <laughs> How many of you do it when you're on holiday? See, this is not good news, is it? And the evidence is now mounting. This is causing enormous trouble. Judith and I work are on something called the National Forum for Health and Wellbeing, 38 major employers, global employers. And the issue they said that was the most important issue for them, and they're all HR directors and chief medical officers and directors of health and well-being like, like Judith. And the first issue they said that was the most important issue for them was the line manager. Whoever that is can damage you or can make you thrive. The second issue, wasn't it? It was about emails. They were all saying it's damaging people because you're on 724. You know the French law? French law nine months ago? It's a national law. No manager, public or private sector, can send an email out of office hours to any of their subordinates. You'd think it's unenforceable, wouldn't you? But guess what? A British company, rent to kill initial, was fined 60,000 euros for breaking the law in, in France. It was a British company, of course. It would be, wouldn't it, in <laughs> France? So, you know, I think this is a big issue. The, the kind of email thing, and, and you're out of all, you know, how it's going to affect you. And this is an area, a new area of research that we really have to get on top of, because social media and everything else, we have all these bells and techn the techn technological bells and whistles, but we never thought about what the implication for human beings are. What you get is bosses doing the following, in a lot of in, in the private sector. They'll send an email on a Friday night or Friday afternoon to, to one of their staff, and they'll say, could you do da 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 But you don't have to do it now. Do it when you get in on Monday morning. This is your boss sending this to you, right? Dumb. Why couldn't he wait, he or she, wait till Monday morning? Write it up because it makes you feel better, lets you less stressed out, and then just send it on Monday morning. Doesn't. Why do you send an email to somebody in the same office building as you? I've just done a television program for Channel 4. It's coming out in the new year. I went into a company, and what we did is we forbid them from doing emails at night, no work emails, and that we forbid them from actually sending it in the big office building at all. And we've said that they had to take lunch off. So they had to leave the building and take a minimum of an hour, and they had to do it with a colleague. And we tried the, an experiment to see what impact that would have. Oh, the other thing we did is we told the manager managing this office of 50 people that he had to tell everybody when they were doing a good job, rather than email them, he had to walk over and say, Fred, that was really good. No, I mean, not bullshit stuff. Not like have a nice day, you know, American way. I mean, when they really did do a good job. Because they actually, he collected metrics on them. He had very clear-cut metrics. He knew when people were doing a good job. They were recruiters, actually. And he knew when they were recruiting, when they got good people. So he'd go over them, and he did that for the whole week. Without, I didn't tell them that, that was going to happen. And when, when you do things like that, even in a seven-day period, you'll see when you see the show, it had a major impact, even in seven days. So they now decided, the director, the chief, chief exec said, that's it, we're doing this stuff now. But it really does make a difference, particularly the boss saying what a good job you've done. That is so important. Um, other uh, characteristics are over-promotion, under-promotion, lack of job security. This is what we're going through right now. Uh, let me show you the lack of job security. This was done by the CMI, the Chartered Management Institute, during the recession, the big recession. I call it the depression. Not, it wasn't one recession. That was really a, a depression. That was a 1929 depression. But you can see how job insecurity ramped up. And by the way, the recent studies on Brexit during this period are having the same impact. People just don't, un, un, it's uncertainty. You know, how do they cope with uncertainty? During the recession, I love this, this came from the Buffalo News, when everybody was losing their job. The boss says, the bad news, Johnson, is you're being let go. The good news, you can have your old job back at half your former pay. I can't live on that. The rest of the good news is we can offer you a second job, also at half your former pay. And it says at the bottom, I'd offer you a third, but I'm afraid of overheating the economy. <laughs> so anyway. And in a way, that's what happened, what's been happening recently since the recession. The people who've been reemployed have had permanent, don't have permanent jobs. So I was giving a lecture to a group of um, managers, quite senior, about 300, from upper middle all the way to senior. And I said, you'd think they'd be field jobs. How many of you 
say you have a permanent job. You are safe. This is about 250, 300 people. One person raised their hand. And everybody looked around and said, what do you do? <laughs> I'd like that job. Anyway, I'm self-employed, the person said. Well, there you are. So they were, they were self-employed. So I think job, but you're, for the younger generation, that's what they expect now. I mean, jobs are not secure. For 35, 40-year-olds and above, you know, they still want a kind of sense of security, the late millennials and the X generation and Y generation. But, you know, I guess you, jobs aren't secure, and that's just the way it is from now on. Um, finally, organization structure and climate. What organizations do you work for? What's it like? That's an important factor. Uh, and we have instruments, psychometric tools, to measure culture. You know, we could look at this university here. We could do the Institute of Psychiatry. I don't think they've ever done an, an audit of themselves. Have they a well-being on it? Have they? Proper psychometrics? You don't know. Yeah, be interesting to see. You could do that, because it doesn't take long to do it, to find out what a culture is like. Does it, Judith? You'll hear about it from Judith later. Um, and homework interface, this is a big issue. And that's why flex people are wanting flexible working. Here's the interesting thing about flexible working. Flexible working doesn't mean flexi time. It means I want to work partly from home, partly from a central office, for those that can do it. And the law changed about 18 months ago, which says all of you, when you get, an, get employment, or if you already have it, have the legal right to ask for flexible working. And your employer has the legal obligation to tell you why you can't have it if you've been working them for a period of months. I think it's 17. I can't remember what it is. That's law. That's been changed, right? Here's the interesting thing. Women apply, and men tend not to. And why don't they? And I did a big study funded by the Lottery Fund, funny enough. I did it with Working Families, which is the body that looks at this. Men think it'll adversely affect their career, and women say, I have no choice, because my job is looking after kids in elder care, right? which is horrible that, that that should be the case. Men don't apply as much. Incidentally, when they do apply, they get rejected more often for the flexible working arrangement they want than women do. So there's a real issue we have here. People want to work more flexibly, but feel it will adversely affect their career. The women say they think it will affect their career, but they have no option because of the main role they think they have in the family. So that's a really big, really important issue. Um, OK, so that's the, some of the, the flavor of the kind of factors. Your boss, how much control you have over your job, technology, how does it interface with you, work-life balance, all those kinds of issues. These are the kinds of things that you can do about it. This is, a, uh, this is something I did for the European, uh, the EU, which is that you can have, you know what EAPs are, Employee Assistance Program? Raise your hands. Who knows what that is? It's counseling services, what you buggers do here. Right? Counseling and learn about that. So employee assistance programs to help people, or you can do resilience training or some of the training techniques, or does mindfulness work, does resilience work, does mental first aid work, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that's more individually orientated things to develop the individual. And then you can do something that's probably much more important, find out what the culture's like, how the employee voice, how do employees perceive my organization? That's a primary, and not as many companies do that and they should be doing it. And that's really what I think is really quite important. But this is the kind of strategy you can use. What's the evidence on well-being? Pretty good. There's a CID report in 2018, the CIPD report, uh, on the organizations they looked at, which one and a half thousand, I think it was, or 1,200, I can't remember. But again, pretty good. You look at this PWC report on 55 companies. Again, if you do something, but it's got to be strategic. So, you know, bean bags and ping pong tables and sushi at your desk is no answer to well-being. All right? Even mindfulness isn't. Right? Because mindfulness is fun, and I enjoy it. I've done it. Right? But does that change a culture which is, has a bullying management style? Does it change a glass ceiling for women? Does it change a long hours culture? Does it change your boss emailing you while you're on holiday? It doesn't change any of that. That's culture. So all that stuff is fun and nice. And by the way, quite a lot of it don't have evidence. So like mental health first aiding, we don't very know much about that. First of all, do we select the right? I mean, 
If you volunteer to do it, you get the training and you do it. Would you select a counselor that way? Not really. I'm not saying that they're counselors, but they certainly are looking, trying to open you up and talk to you about your problems. And, you know, and, and you get a certain amount of training. But I have a student doing a PhD right now who's, who's actually looking at the impact of that. Are the right people selected? Is the training good enough? Does it work? Are they producing the goodies? Are they actually helping people? Or is it basically helping themselves? I don't mind them helping themselves, by the way, because I think people go into counseling, go into it with certain issues themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if it's only helping themselves and not helping others, then we got a, we got a bit of a problem. So we need more research in that kind of an area, I think, personally. Um, by the way, NICE has stuff on stress. And they have, you know, they have looked at this as an area. You know, the people who do the pharmaceutical stuff, mainly. Uh, but it, it's quite an interesting one. They did this a long time ago. These, I think it's 2009. Yeah, it was 2009 when they came up with standards about what companies should do in this kind of arena. There's a, a lot of good case study. I don't have as much time to go over case studies. I'll show you something I think you'll like. Uh, here's, let me go back. I'm trying to convince Judith from Mace, the builder, to do this. She has a great case study, so she's going to have to produce this. This is what we did is, um, um, my un I have a university spinoff company. We do develop psychometric products online and do stuff in the well-being arena. One of our clients is Network Rail. And what we were looking at is people who work on the rail, oopsie doodle, people who work on the rail line, right? Not managers or professionals, just the people working on the rail line. So what we did is we gave them on a mobile phone to measure their resilience and their health quickly to do it. We, we had Lancaster University design us something on the phone. So they'd pick their phone up, and when they were feeling not very resilient or a bit stressed or not feeling very good, they, they do it. Then it shot into a computer, and then the computer told us Newcastle over the last month have problems. In the New Newcastle area, we don't know what it is. Go find out. It was a really clever idea, right, to say, you know, in real time, and we're not doing enough measurements, I think, in real time, and we need to do that now, uh, uh, to measure what people are thinking right here and now. And I remember once I went into Tesco headquarters, and Tesco headquarters had something really interesting. They wanted to find out whether people were having a good day at work or not. So in all the lifts, they had the little funny face, the nice smiley face versus the sad face. So all you did, you walked into the lift at the beginning of the day, and you hit it, you know. Sad face, horrible face, happy face, eh, sort of in the middle face, right? And they'd calculate the end of the day what people did and what floor they were on, and then try to say, well, floor four has got a bit of a problem here. So you know what I mean? It's quite interesting. But the point about that I'm trying to make, it wasn't a big scientific thing. It was a vehicle to try to measure in real time what people are feeling rather than do a once a year appraisal or a once a year this or that. Uh, unless you do it all the time. Okay, but here's what we did with MACE. We figured out that, uh, not with MACE, with uh, Network Rail, we figured out that there was a correlation, very high correlation, between a person's psychological well-being and their productivity, and we could measure it. So we found it was 0.46, right? And we took a look at the highly productive people and the lowest productive people. Then what we did is we did a formula, very simple formula. And then what we did is from the formula, Given that we found this high correlation, we calculated that the company had actually saved the financial benefit of doing the psychological intervention they did, saved them 1,201 pounds for each person. That the sample we did is we took a sample of nearly 3,000 people, it was about 15% of the workforce, and the productivity increases would amount to 468,390 pounds. And then we said, of the company's total workforce, if we increase that productivity, it would be 6.1 million. If we did it across the country, it would be 5.6 billion. If we only improved the well-being of 15% of the people, not 80, just 15% of the people. So what could you get for that? 243, for the country, 243,000 nurses, or alternatively, 21,500 Lamborghinis. But well-being is not this. Tomorrow is the mandatory meeting on employee health and well-being, says the boss. 
The meeting starts at 6 a.m., so it will interfere with your sleep and not your work. Doesn't that send a message that work is more important than health? I hope so. That's the theme of the meeting, says the boss. Healthy employees are unproductive. They're always exercising or eating fruit when they should be working. We prefer employees who work hard and die before their pensions start paying out. Suddenly I feel sick, says the employee. Right on schedule, says the boss. That is not well-being. And to conclude, I'm through now, honestly I am, just I want to read something to you. The whole concept of well-being is not a new concept. But listen to this. The first person to ever mention this, you're all too young to remember. Did you ever hear of John Kennedy? Okay, he was president of the United States. He had a brother called Bobby Kennedy, who was absolutely wonderful. He, he sorted out the whole civil rights movement, Bobby Kennedy. And he was assassinated, unfortunately, in my hometown of LA. Two weeks before he was assassinated, he was on, he was going, he was on, trying to get the presidential, Democratic presidential nomination. And he gave a speech, and the name of the speech was no gross national, what we have is GDP, gross domestic product. That's everything that we produce, we add up, right? That's our growth. In those days it was called gross national product. It was everything it's, you produce from bombs to bullets to anything you produce, to tires, okay? And he, his speech was gross national product versus gross national well-being. So he was the first person ever to mention that. Here's, let me just mention a bit of his speech, because I love this that he said. He said, too much and for too long we see him to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette production and advertising, and the ambulances to clear our highways of the carnage. Remember, this is Vietnam time. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in the chaotic sprawl of our cities. It counts napalm bombs and counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our street. Yet the national, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages or relationships, or the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials, Brexit. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. Is that powerful? That was where well-being really started, the whole concept of it. And now we have the UN voted in 2010. 97 countries signed the Bhutan Declaration saying we should no longer measure GDP. But it's 2019, and although 97 countries signed up, including the UK, we haven't done it. We're still on material you know, accumulation. Anyway, thank you very much.